to a mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God, the Reformation hymn by Martin Luther, and we'll stand together as we sing together. Downstairs, and we put uh, Ralph Baxter's name on here. So that plaque is now complete, and another one is on order for uh, to put Don Whitaker on that as well. Uh, we're remembering our heritage a little bit today with Ralph, and I heard from Brian Baxter this week that the house uh, they are selling the house. Uh, and they found these commentary books in Ralph's things that he had used for his studies. And it, these, uh, Brian and family, wanted to donate to the church library. And so we're going to put just a little card in there as we dedicate these Clark commentary to our church library in memory of Ralph and then there were also some chairs that were returned for fellowship that way. So as part of our Reformation Sunday, and part of our 
memory of those that have gone on before. Let's have a, a, a brief dedication as we dedicate ourselves to carrying on the message of life only in Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can uh, remember our heritage, and we remember uh, Don, but also Ralph and Margaret today, and our, the heritage of our fathers, and those that have founded this church, and have uh, carried out the message of life only in Christ, and of the soon second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We ask, Lord, that we might now rededicate ourselves, too, to proclaiming this truth, the truth of Scripture, and carrying on the message of hope in our community that needs this message of hope. We ask you to bless these resources and bless our church for the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take up our hymn book again, and we're going to, let's see, where is it? Going to use some different songs to sing. The first one is number 30. Number 30. We have an unusual service today, but we have a little bit of throwback to a time where there was no electricity. We're forced into it today. <laughs> Number 30, How Firm a Foundation. Let's sing the first and the last. Could you give us a first note? I can barely see. Uh, how firm a foundation Thank you. 
267, 267, we can give thanks even in difficult times, he is Lord. Capture the heart of a student 
and take them toward rapid improvement, even without the student's conscious uh, permission. Before the student knows what's going on, he or she is fully engaged in learning, whether they really wanted to or not. And uh, students just can't help but learning from a really great teacher. I should know. I've had many good teachers. I married a great teacher. I have great teachers in my household as well. Adult children who are both professional teachers in different areas. I like being around teachers. I like being around you as well. And there's some great teachers out here too. I think it's great that our church has so many public school employees as well. The professional athlete, sports athlete, may earn or receive 10 or 20 times what uh, a teacher does, but a really good teacher will have a lasting outcome on the character development of a student. And not many athletes will give their professional time to someone else, like a teacher does. Great teachers give their best energy to helping others. So what's it called when, you, uh, when someone sacrificially gives their best to advance someone else that needs attention? Sacrificially giving one's best to help someone else. What's that called? All right, don't everybody shout it at once. <laughs> L-O-V-E, yes, thank you. Love, love, that's what great teachers give. In our passage, the lawyer had come to Jesus for the purpose of putting Jesus, the Lord of all the universe, to the test. That's what Matthew tells us. He was the third string tester, we might say, uh, for Jesus in the temple at Jerusalem. The Pharisees, the Sadducees had gone down to defeat. Now the lawyer, the scribe, brought out a perennial question that had troubled the Jewish leaders for many years. Of all the commandments, which is the most important one? I think it was both a legitimate question, but also a test of Jesus' authority. The rabbis had identified 613 commandments, do's and don'ts, in the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, how could anyone possibly keep track of all 613 of those things? People then, people now, are still trying to simplify and uh, maybe only do the minimal effort of the law. Uh, anyway, uh, what's it called when someone tries to do the minimal effort? The least I can do to please God and still be saved. <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> Not love. <laughs> Not L-O-V-E. And of course, I was going to project all that and make it easier to see. But anyway, not love. When someone selfishly gives their least to, self, to help someone that needs attention. It's called not love. <laughs> Unlove. Teaching is more than information transfer. You know that. Jesus was such an excellent teacher that he not only gave the teacher of the law the answer to his question, which we have in our passage, but he also indicated the meaning of the love commandments in every way. So if you're following along, first, Jesus taught about the love of God by including the word of God, the word, and including the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why had the teacher of the law come to Jesus? To test 
Jesus, not to learn from Jesus. Matthew says he had come to test Jesus. So the lawyer had not come with love for Jesus. He had not come with love for his neighbor. He did not live up to the commandment. And Jesus, however, did live up to the commandment and fulfilled the commandment in every way to love God and love neighbor. He even, Jesus even loved his accusers and loved those that were trying to test him. Jesus is the most excellent teacher and he is the incarnation, the fleshing out of love itself. And Jesus taught us also to love our neighbor instead of accusing, instead of testing people or trying to trap people into failure like they were trying to trap and test Jesus. The great thing about this story is that unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees and others in chapter 12, this man instead seems to have a softer heart and agreed with Jesus and said in verse 32, Well said, teacher, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This man seems to have a softer heart. And when we agree with Jesus teaching through the word, then we're on the right track. This man, I believe, could not help but learn good things from Jesus, the most excellent teacher. The man had come to test Jesus on legal, technical matters, and yet Jesus, in his love, led the lawyer, the scribe, the teacher of the law, to the heart of what it was all about. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus quoted the scripture, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Jesus is the most excellent teacher, and he taught love by the word of God. Now, let's make a transition, go to the second point. The most excellent teacher, Jesus, also taught love through his loving interaction with the lawyer. Not just by words, but also by his interaction with this person. The lawyer had come to test him. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Quite a reversal. So let me remind you once more of the purpose of the Old Testament law. The purpose of the Old Testament law was never to save any person. The law never saved. The purpose was to show us our sin and our need for salvation by faith in the Lord God, in Christ Jesus, and to restrain evil in society. It has these two purposes. Jesus, the most excellent teacher, used the law, even these two commandments, for the purpose right in this passage the right purpose of showing this person his need for salvation. They came to Jesus to test Jesus in order to make him fail. But Jesus brought up, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your being. Were those Pharisees? Were those Sadducees? Was this person, this lawyer, were they loving the Lord God with all their heart? Were they loving their neighbor as, as themselves? Certainly not. They were guilty of not loving Jesus. And he used the law in a loving way and showed them their sin of not loving him and not loving the Lord God nor loving uh, this presentation of of uh, the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The law of love 
cuts off all self-justification. See, we will never love God enough in order to earn our salvation. We will never love our neighbors enough in order for God to say, oh yeah, you did a good job loving your neighbor. Come on in and, and be saved forever. That's not the way we are saved. Jesus is the most excellent teacher using the law to show his very accusers their need for salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. On this Reformation Sunday, I remind you again, you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, by believing, not by keeping the law. Now, let's make a transition one more time and go to our third point. Jesus, the most excellent teacher, revealed the surpassing love of God in his loving actions as the atoning sacrifice for your sin. God demonstrated his love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, according to 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And it continues, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Jesus, the most excellent teacher, taught us love through becoming our sacrifice, our atonement for our sins. I was going to show you a picture of Booker T. Washington. Maybe you've heard about Booker T. Washington. He was born near and uh, lived the first part of his life near Roanoke on a plantation as a slave. He became a leader in education as a freed man and headed up the Tuskegee Institute. Union soldiers liberated Booker T. Washington and his family from plantation life, and he and his mother walked over 200 miles this way and made their home in Malden, West Virginia, just outside uh, Charleston. I had to look it up. I'd never heard of it before. But I, I hear there's a place where you can go there just off the, the turnpike and see where he lived. They started a new life in 1865, and Booker T. Washington wrote an autobiography called Up From Slavery, and he wrote a little bit about what it was like to be a slave there near Roanoke. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read a little bit about it. The most trying ordeal that I was forced to endure as a slave boy, however, was the wearing of a flax shirt. In the portion of Virginia where I lived, it was common to use flax as part of the clothing for slaves. That part of the flax from which our clothing was made was largely the refuse, which of course was the cheapest and roughest part. I can scarcely imagine any torture except perhaps the pulling of a tooth that is equal to that caused by putting on a new flax shirt for the first time. It's almost equal to the feeling that one would experience if he had a dozen or more chestnut burrs or a hundred small pinpoints in contact with his flesh. Even to this day, I can recall accurately the tortures that I underwent when putting on one of those garments. Uh, but I had no choice. I had to wear the flax shirt or none. And had it been left to me to choose, I should have chosen to wear no covering at all. In connection with the flax shirt, my brother John, who is several years older than I am, performed one of the most generous acts that I ever heard of one slave relative doing for another. On several occasions, when I was being forced to wear a new flax shirt, he generously agreed to put it on in my stead and wear it for several days, till it was broken in, he puts in quotes. Until I had grown to be quite a youth, this single garment was all that I wore. 
Now, we have an even greater teacher to teach us about love. Jesus took our entire place. He put it on. Not the flax shirt, but the punishment for our sins. He took it all upon himself, what belonged to us. And he died for our sin. He rose again from the grave and is now reigning victorious over sin, over death, and over all evil. And he's coming back again for all his people. Jesus is the most excellent teacher. Because he teaches about and is the very embodiment of love for you. Love is Jesus, as expressed in the Word of God to us. Love is Jesus, the missionary love of God for lost people. When they accused him, Jesus lovingly showed them their sin. They were not loving God. They were not loving their neighbor with all their being. They came to accuse. But Jesus came to love and to seek and to save all who accept him as Savior. As the true authority coming into the temple there at Jerusalem, his very own house. And Jesus still wants to come into our house every day, into your temple. Love is Jesus, the sacrificial action of God himself for us on our behalf. We have nothing to offer the Lord except the flax shirt of pain and our suffering, and he puts it on in our stead. John the Apostle used to be known as one of the sons of thunder. He wanted to call down fire and punishment on the people in Samaria who rejected Jesus. And I can relate a little bit to this, because when I was really young, I wanted some bad things to happen when people got at me. And I, I had a quick temper, too. When I was 10 or 11, uh, my brother aggravated so much, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I'm not justifying this, saying it's wrong, but or right or wrong, but... Uh, I punched him right in the news, nose. <laughs> My poor little brother, he's only about five years old, and I made his nose all bloody. Yeah, it wasn't good. <laughs> but the Lord continues his grace to me. I, I've asked for his forgiveness, and we're on great speaking terms. I love my brother, Jonathan. Now he's taller and bigger than I am. I wouldn't dare do that anyway. But, <laughs> but the Lord works on people to transform us to be loving people. And to, the short fuse gets longer and longer as we abide in Christ Jesus. And that's what happened to the John the Apostle. John had been with Jesus. It was transformed by Jesus. He lived in the spirit of Jesus. And toward the end of his life, John was ready to write the gospel of John and the first, second, and third book of John, which is all about the love of God, not the fire of judgment coming down upon Samaria and these other places that he wanted to call it. John was ready to express love and to carry that out. And God's still working on us to transform our short fuses into loving, patient, sacrificial help for others. That's what love is about. And you know, I don't need to keep going. Jesus was the most excellent teacher of love. And you will experience a transformation if you invite Jesus to continue to work in your life and transform you into being a living witness of God's love. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we're here today recognizing that 
we too have fallen short of the glory of God, of the perfect standard of your love. But we're reminded again that you love sinners. And you came to seek and to save those that were lost. Thank you for forgiving us of our sin. We have fallen short, yet your grace comes to us. Thank you for taking our place. Thank you for your transformative work within us, transforming us into being your loving agents right here in this place, in this time, for purpose. Don't let our love grow cold, either for the church, or for one another, or for those that are lost. Warm our hearts with your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now we get to sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing. Oh, yes, 633. 633 in your books. 633. Thank you, Curtis. 633. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
number. 428, the bond of love. 428. 428, just the first verse. We are one in the bond of love. We are one. time. God bless you and be with you, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday.